Is I, I feel that 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 uh, someone is responsible for what happened, and I can't say who that is, but I know it's not me. Alec Baldwin has been charged for the death of Helena Hutchins again. Today, a New Mexico grand jury indicted the actor for involuntary manslaughter. I'm Ellison Barber, in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Alec Baldwin is heading to trial over the death of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer who was shot and killed on the set of Baldwin's movie Rust when he fired a prop gun that had a live round of ammunition. If found guilty, the actor could face up to 18 months in jail. His lawyers responded to the decision, saying they, quote, look forward to their day in court. Last November, NBC News obtained six of the dozens of videos turned over to special prosecutors that show Baldwin on set in character and firing the prop guns. The videos also seem to show at some points Baldwin rearranging some of the crew after they'd expressed safety concerns. Today's decision comes nine months after the same prosecutors actually dismissed involuntary manslaughter charges against Baldwin. Last year, the film's weapons expert, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, was also charged with manslaughter for Hutchins' death. Her trial starts next month. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin joins us now. So, Dana, walk us through this indictment and what prompted prosecutors to seek out charges again. Yeah, Ellison, so when these charges were initially dropped back in April of last year, prosecutors said it was possible that they could be refiled, and that's exactly what happened today, but with a grand jury indictment. So I want to look at the indictment because there are two charges listed, but it will be up to a jury to decide which one sticks if Alec Baldwin is convicted. So one is involuntary manslaughter, negligent use of a firearm, and involuntary manslaughter without due caution or circumspection. That means that he could have possibly pulled the trigger, trigger knowingly or he did it unintentionally, but still it caused the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. And that's why they are criminally charging him in this case, because they feel like he should be held accountable. Ellison. So, Dana, do we have any sense of how Baldwin is going to plead? I mean, there was a time when he was very vocal talking about what happened here. He claimed at one point that he did not pull the trigger on the gun at all. Yeah, and his attorney sent a statement today saying that they look forward to they, their day in court. So they're likely going to try to get this case dismissed or he's likely to plead not guilty because, as you mentioned, he has said all along that he did not pull the trigger. Uh, so we'll be waiting to see what happens next, Ellison. So talk to us, if you can, Dana, a little more about that situation involving the gun and the question of whether or not Alec Baldwin actually pulled the trigger. It seems like prosecutors in this instance are saying that and maybe part of what motivated them to bring this to a grand jury and consider charges again was that they had some sort of forensic data investigation suggesting, no, he did pull this gun and it was not, quote unquote, cold as they'd previously been told. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, exactly. So part of why the charges were dropped last year was because there was some concerns that maybe this gun may not have been working properly. So the prosecutors with the FBI forensics team, they conducted several tests on this weapon to see did it misfire or was it not functioning properly and in their ballistics report I can read part of you they say although Alec Baldwin repeatedly denies pulling the trigger given the facts findings and observations reported here the trigger had to be pulled or depressed sufficiently to release the fully cocked or retract hammer so there's the evidence that they say they gave to this grand jury and that's likely why they issued this indictment today. Ellison. And Dana, there were multiple people sort of involved in this situation and the first go round of trial of charges and discussions of what might happen on the criminal side. There was a weapons expert that actually did have a manslaughter trial. I think it's still ongoing. How could that impact Alec Baldwin? Yeah, so the upcoming trial of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, she is the armorer uh, in this case. She's expected to go to trial in February. And it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens in that case because it could lay out the blueprint for the defense in Alec Baldwin's case. So there were two people that were charged in, in this case. One has already pleaded guilty. He's already um, been sentenced to uh, 
uh, probation. So Gutierrez Reed, she is the woman who was responsible for loading that gun and handing it to Alec Baldwin, who says he had no idea that live rounds were inside that weapon. It's still unclear exactly how live ammo got mixed in with those dummy uh, bullets that should have been used during that scene. But that is likely to come out in this case. And I spoke with our NBC an analyst, legal analyst, Danny Savalos, and he said that if they can prove that this that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was the person responsible, then it could land an acquittal in the Baldwin case. So again, something that we'll have to wait and see what happens in that case. But if she is found guilty, then it could be a win for the Baldwin case. Hmm. Ellison? Dana Griffin, thank you so much. We appreciate it. A seven-hour video of former President Donald Trump answering questions in his $370 million civil fraud case is now public. It comes from a closed-door session last April. During the deposition, the Republican presidential frontrunner claims to have saved the world from nuclear war, brags about his multi-billion-dollar business, then complains for having to be part of this whole legal process. Take a listen to some of it. You don't have a case, and you should drop this case. And it's a shame that somebody that's done such a good job, the convention center in New York, so many things I did for this city, the job on the west side of Manhattan, thousands of people employed, and now I have to come and justify myself to you? I have to come after doing all of that and paid massive taxes, state taxes and city taxes, and now I have to come in here and justify myself and have crowds of people waiting on the street? It's a disgrace. New York Attorney General Letitia James released the video earlier today following a public records request. The deposition was part of a lawsuit accusing Trump and his business associates of intentionally lying about his company's value in order to secure better loan terms. Trump denies any wrongdoing. Earlier this week, the New York Court of Appeals dismissed a request from Trump related to the gag order that was issued in his civil fraud trial. It prevents Trump and his lawyers from making public statements about the case. The trial part of that case ended last week. A ruling is expected later this month. It's just one of several legal battles facing the former president, including a slew of lawsuits and nearly 100 felony charges across four states. For more on all of this, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella. So, Angela, uh, this deposition, let's start here. There's a lot of different things we could talk about today, but let's start with this deposition, the video, because there was a transcript that was released back in the fall from this deposition, but it's another thing to see and hear all of it. I want to play a little more of this and then get your reaction to it. Let's watch. Basically, they were told that this thing didn't mean anything and certainly didn't mean much, and they accepted it. And you know what? They got their money back in full, and they're not complaining. You're the only one complaining. Instead of stopping violent crime, you're complaining. What has been your thought process reaction to actually seeing all of this? What stood out to you from a legal perspective? So I think we're seeing a lot of these arguments that, frankly, would have played so well in front of a jury had his team requested a jury trial. Because on its face, these arguments are not unreasonable. There were no victims. Nobody was hurt. This is a standard relationship between a banker, a lender, and a borrower. And that he is allegedly the only one being targeted here. So these arguments, I think, are powerful. The problem, as we know, is this is a bench trial. There's only one judge deciding. And the judge is deciding on the letter of the law. And the law here allows the attorney general to have wide discretion to institute penalties, huge ones, even for things just like misrepresentation. So what I'm saying is it doesn't even matter whether or not there were no victims. It doesn't matter if this is standards. What matters is that the judge thinks the attorney general had the power here. When you watch back that deposition, do you think Donald Trump's legal team made a mistake by taking the route that they took and asking for that bench trial instead of something with a jury? I do. I think that his best chance here would have been in front of a jury. As we saw, the judge actually issued summary judgment even before the trial began. In front of a jury, these arguments make a lot more sense. So when we are looking at this case as it is right now, and you have this judge, Judge Ngoran, who is going to ultimately make the ruling here, what sort of outstanding questions might he be looking to answer at this point? 
So we know the summary judgment happened for fraud overall, but now it's a question of whether or not all the instances of fraud happened. And those are actually crimes the attorney general is alleging couched in this civil lawsuit. So the judge is going to see, did he actually commit insurance fraud? Did he falsify documents? Was there malicious intent? Did he know what he was doing was wrong? And then as a result, it's a question of damages. What sort of damages will he apply? Because on the table here is a lifetime ban from commercial real estate. In addition, to the $370 million plus penalty that you mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's talk about some of the issues in other states where he is being pulled from or there are efforts to pull him from the presidential ballot. Let's look at Colorado here. That is now uh, something that the Colorado State Supreme Court is weighing in on, has weighed in on. The whole argument here in Colorado is centered around the 14th Amendment, right? And tied to January 6th and saying that he is no longer eligible to be president in this state. Talk to us about where things stand with that case and what we have heard in recent days from Trump's legal team. Yes, this is a monster case that is now in front of the Supreme Court, and we just saw Trump's team put a forth a filing so we know what his arguments are going to be. And there, he's attacking legally every single word in that Section 3, that the presidency is not in office, that the question there is someone holding office, but he's just running for office. He's also saying he didn't actually engage in an insurrection. He is noting appropriately that the prosecutors of any county have not actually gone after him with that precise insurrection charge. But bigger than that, I think, is this heartstrings argument he's making in front of the Supreme Court, which is that if they were to rule against him, they would be disenfranchising millions of people in America. And I think that's going to be the most important argument for the Supreme Court. They never want to take away that right from the voter. Interesting stuff. Angela Sinadella, thank you so much for your time and insight. As always, we appreciate it. All right, explosive new claims about Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis are threatening to derail her election interference case against Donald Trump. Remember, this is the one in Georgia. One of Trump's co-defendants in that case has accused Willis of hiring a romantic partner as her special prosecutor and of financially benefiting from the arrangement. Today, the Fulton County commissioner said he's pursuing an investigation into whether the DA misused county funds. In a statement to NBC News, he said this, quote, Something isn't right with this, and clear answers are warranted and deserved. Adding, quote, the content revealed in the various proceedings are grossly concerning, and all Fulton County citizens and taxpayers deserve clear and truthful answers from D.A. Willis. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the details from outside the Fulton County Courthouse. Blaine. Well, Ellison, this certainly has become a very unexpected sort of sideshow here in Fulton County, but certainly one that's garnering a lot of attention and could be impactful. So essentially, this started last week. One of the lesser known Trump co-defendants, Michael Roman, through his attorney, filed a motion alleging that Fonnie Willis and special prosecutor Nathan Wade were having a romantic relationship. Now, they're saying, however, that there was alleged wrongdoing because they claim that Willis financially benefited from that arrangement basically saying that Wade used some of the money that he made as a special prosecutor to purchase trips for them, uh, to buy trips for them. And because of that, they say that Willis benefited from that, and that's something that they say should disqualify her from prosecuting this case altogether. Now, we know that on February 15th, uh, Judge Scott McAfee is going to be hearing arguments on this. He set a hearing to bring forth uh, more information, possibly more uh, evidence on this. It is important to say that that filing did not produce any direct evidence of those claims, only citing people with knowledge. Now, in the days since this was filed last week, we've seen a lot of back and forth, including learning more about the ongoing divorce proceedings between Nathan Wade and his now estranged wife, Joycelyn Wade. In fact, the latest is today that there were some credit card records that were made public as part of a filing on behalf of Joycelyn Wade showing that Nathan Wade purchased tickets for himself and for Fonnie Willis to travel at least to Miami and to San Francisco. They say that that kind of underscores their claim that they were traveling together. All of this certainly is going to be coming forward in more detail on February 15th. Now, as for Fonnie Willis, she has not responded to this directly. Uh, her office says that she plans to respond in writing. A judge has set a deadline of February 2nd for her to do so. Elson? NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander in Fulton County, Georgia. Thank you. Meanwhile, we are entering the final weekend of campaigning before Tuesday's New Hampshire primary. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley are ramping up attacks against one another as the former president gets a boost from a one-time rival. 
with ties to Haley's home state. Here's Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker with more. With four days until New Hampshire votes, frontrunner Donald Trump is looking for a victory that could all but wrap up the nomination. Republicans have to get tougher, but Nikki would, I know Nikki very well, she would not be able to handle the onslaught. A new poll showing him with a 17 point lead here over Nikki Haley. Trump arguing she's relying on independents allowed to vote in this GOP primary. She's not going to make it. She has no chance. She's got no way. Maggie's not going to be with her. How am I not conservative? I was a Tea Party governor. I passed voter ID. Haley focusing on age, warning Republicans against choosing a 77-year-old nominee to face off against an 81-year-old President Biden. Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? I actually feel better now than I did 30 years ago. And I think cognitively I'm better than I was 20 years ago. I don't know why. The generational argument appealing to 23-year-old Haley supporter Nathan Seal. Nikki Haley says it's time for a new generation of leaders. Do you agree with her? I agree with her. It's time for a new generation of leaders. I really wouldn't like a matchup between uh, Trump and Biden again. But Augusta Patron says she's struggling with high prices and will vote for Trump. I admire his uh, courage and guts, and I, I accept the mouth. I think what he's accomplished is uh, awesome. Then there's Doreen Pooler, who's still undecided between Haley and DeSantis. When will you make up your mind? But quite frankly, I'll probably end up making up as I walk in to, to actually fill up my ballot. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. Welcome back. Here's some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Today, U.S. and Mexican officials resumed immigration talks in Washington, D.C. They discussed some ways to deter illegal immigration and crossings at the southern border. They have skyrocketed to record levels over the last few months. President Biden is facing increasing pressure to do something about what is happening there. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has been called to testify before Congress in February. It's over his failure to immediately notify the White House about his recent hospitalization. The GOP-led House Armed Services Services Committee launched a formal inquiry into why the DOD waited three days to tell the White House Austin was in the ICU. The White House this week canceled $5 billion worth of student debt for 74,000 borrowers. The Biden administration said many of the borrowers had their debt wiped after working in public service for a decade. They apparently included teachers, firefighters, as well as nurses. The Supreme Court struck down Biden's debt relief plan last year. The White House has since launched smaller relief programs like this to help those with a lot of student debt. Spelman College in Atlanta just got a $100 million donation this week. It is now the largest single gift to a historically black college ever. Billionaires Rana Stryker and William Johnston donated the gift. And a small plane landed on a Virginia Parkway earlier today. You heard that right, on a parkway earlier today. No one was hurt and the plane did not hit any cars. There were seven people on board and the flight was apparently headed to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's not really clear why they made an emergency landing. An Arctic blast is bringing dangerously cold temperatures and inches of snow tonight to the East Coast, marking yet another back-to-back -back winter storm in two weeks. Temperatures right now across the country are in the teens or single digits in some areas, but wind chills, they're making it feel like the negatives. And states all along the Northeast, they could see one to five inches of snow. NBC News has confirmed that more than 50 people have died this week due to the weather and tens of millions are under winter alerts heading into the weekend. So why officials are reminding people to be careful in these frigid conditions. New York State's Department of Transportation releasing this video of a car crashing into a plow truck earlier this week after the driver tried to pass on a snow-covered road. No one was hurt here, but a scary situation. In Arkansas, this man stepped in to help his neighbor whose calf got stuck in the middle of a frozen pond. You can see him lasso that rope around it and just drag it to safety right as the ice started cracking. Meanwhile, Oregon is now under a state of emergency after severe ice storms pummeled the state, leaving streets frozen and thousands of people without power. Our team is tracking this latest Arctic blast. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman is standing by in studio. But first, let's go to NBC News correspondent George Solis in Philadelphia. 
George, Philadelphia could see up to five inches of snow, right? How are things looking at this moment where you are? Yeah, Allison, well, the snow has begun to taper a little bit, but the snow emergency remains, and that's because snow could still be accumulating, even with these light flurries. And once it all stops, the concern is any untreated surface could then freeze over as temperatures are expected to plummet. And that is a real concern for officials and businesses around the region who have spent most of the day trying to make sure that anything that did accumulate got completely uh, swept off the roads, making sure things were treated with salt. You had work crews out here plowing around the clock to make Make sure the conditions did not deteriorate again as those temperatures begin to plunge. Still, a lot of people taking this weather event very seriously as this area has not seen significant snowfall like this in 700 plus days. Take a listen. Honestly, it's kind of scary. I mean, just making sure your tires are all set up, uh, but it's also fun. I love snow. It's kind of, it looks like chaos, but it's also peaceful at the same time. And speaking of that piece, we did find a lot of people taking advantage of this snow day, ourselves included, finding some hills to go uh, sledding on. The first time for me. So, again, a little bit good with the bad, but a lot of people hoping that the worst of this is over. As, again, this region has not seen this level of snowfall in some time, Allison. Yeah, that is something. Okay, so, George, when we're looking at the winter mixes we have seen really across the country, we have seen in city after city cars abandoned because of slippery roads. We saw a plane actually slide on an icy runway in New York just yesterday. Are we seeing any major travel impacts today? And if you know, what should people be bracing for, I guess, as we head into the weekend? Yeah, something to keep an eye on are going to be ground stops, especially with those icy conditions here in Philadelphia. Ground stop ordered until about 11 o'clock p.m. Around the country, just looking at flight aware, we've seen more than 7,000 delays and more than 1,000 cancellations, which, again, we could expect to see more of as, again, tem temperatures begin to plummet. It's been a real inconvenience on roadways, too. Of course, you see uh, some of the visuals of trucks and cars that have uh, been sliding around, trucks that jackknife. So this is a real threat when you talk about significant snowfall even, again even a little bit of snowfall that freezes can really make conditions on the road very treacherous which is why officials urge everybody to avoid the roadways until every surface gets treated Allison yeah I am a big snow fan and I would be right there sledding with you George but a very good reminder driving and cars <laughs> we should take a different approach George Solis in Philadelphia thank you Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman now. Michelle, I feel like it's a very unpopular opinion, but I actually like the cold and the snow. But a lot of people, I do, and I know that's everyone's reaction. A lot of people, though, they want warmer temperatures. Uh, when could me? they get them? Me, I want <laughs> like 78 <laughs> degrees. We're not going to get that for a while, but we are going to see a pattern change next week. Okay. So uh, first, we need to get through this weekend because we're looking at. I'm still like shocked by that, but 61 million people <laughs> impacted by wind chill alerts from the northern plains into the central plains. The the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, Tennessee Valley, down to the south central states, into the Gulf Coast states. We're looking at wind chills well below zero in so many spots and air temperatures 20 to 30 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. Also by tomorrow morning, 15 million people impacted by freeze warnings, freeze watches along the Gulf Coast states into the south central states. So you need to cover your pipes. You need to cover those plants that you want to uh, that want that need to survive uh, despite those cold temperatures. So we're looking at icy cold weekend. Once again, you need to bundle up as you're heading out. And a lot of us are going to see really cold temperatures. Chicago, just 14 degrees tomorrow. It's going to feel like one degree. So you factor in the winds and we're going to feel a lot colder than that. Feeling like 10 in Memphis tomorrow, feeling like 20 in Birmingham and DC, you're going to feel like 12. So once again, really, really cold. We're going to be cold once again on Sunday. We're looking at temperatures, just four degrees, the wind chill in Chicago, feeling like 32 in Tupelo, 41 in Atlanta will be the air temperature feeling like the 30s and New York City you're going to be below freezing on Sunday the uh, wind chill feeling like 21 degrees as we go throughout the late week late week here this is the change in the pattern a January thaw although you look at these numbers it doesn't feel very thawing but much better than where we were so Cleveland by Tuesday into the 40s 41 on Tuesday 43 on Wednesday DC 46 into the 50s by Wednesday and New York City we're going to be into the 40s Tuesday and Wednesday Raleigh looking much better too 65 I like that number there by Wednesday. 
This is why we have that jet stream so far to the south. So we're going to deal with this tonight. We're going to deal with it tomorrow, also on Sunday. It's sort of like opening up your front door to really cold weather. So we're opening up that door to Canada, allowing this Arctic air come all the way down to the Gulf Coast states. So below average for most of us as we go throughout tomorrow, also on Sunday. But then look what happens. That jet stream comes back up. And most of us, at least the eastern half of the nation, the northern tier of the nation that have been suffering with those cold temperatures are going to be above average. So looking really good. I like when I see some oranges and some reds, some yellows on the map, indicating that milder air come into place. Let's look at the weekend here because we, have, we talked about the cold weather in the northern plains, the south central plains, into the northeast as well. We have lake effect snow. We're going to be adding on inches. We're probably not going to be adding on feet like we were the past couple of days, but we still have those really warm lake waters, those really cold winds coming over it. So we're going to add about six inches in some spots from Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, down, downwind, also in portions of Michigan as well. Looking good in terms of dry weather in the southeast and then as we head towards portions of the west coast heavy rain and snow this is going to be a big story Saturday, Sunday, into the early parts of next week. It's a big system. It's a series of systems that will be moving on shore. We talked about that ice that sort of paralyzed Oregon, and we have lots of power outages still. We're going to get above 40 degrees tomorrow, so that's going to help, but still really heavy rain along the coast where you see those bright colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. We're going to see the chance for some flash flooding and some mountain snow. We will be measuring feet and snow in portions of the, uh, in, of the west. Then as we go towards Sunday, bitterly cold still in the northern tier of the nation along the Great Lakes. Still, though, looking at that lake effect snow, it will be windy, too. So just kind of a miserable day to be outdoors. I know a lot of playoff games this weekend. Saint Dora's be cozy on the couch. That southeast chill still in place, but lots of sunshine. And then we're going to be dealing with some rain in the south central states. But looking towards the west, we're looking at unsettled weather once again. It's into the inner mountain west, into portions of the Rockies as well. We have some rain in the forecast that could cause some flash flooding. So into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as well, especially in northern parts of California. Also looking at that snow falling, so we're going to be measuring that once again in feet. Uh, we're looking at the chance for some ice as well, and that's going to be continuing as we go throughout the next couple of days. Allison? Izzy out west, Michelle uh -huh. Grossman. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. I appreciate it. Okay, so we've been talking about all of this snow we've been getting across the country and how it is impacting your weekend plans and also travel plans, but we want to dive a little bit deeper into the why is this happening. NBC national climate reporter Chase Kane tells us more about the climate connection behind all of this wintry weather. Bone chilling cold because of climate change? Yeah. I know it seems counterintuitive, but I can explain with a charging cable. And we'll actually start with the source of that frigid air, the Arctic, a place that is warming four times faster than anywhere else on Earth. And the ice melting and all the rapid changes that are happening up there are having an effect on the jet stream. And of course, the jet stream is this rapid river of wind high over our heads that really controls all of our weather. Dr. Jennifer Francis studies the Arctic's impact on our weather and she explained that as the region warms, the jet stream slows and gets a little bit more wobbly or wavy. Think of it like this charging cable. A fast moving jet stream is sort of like tension. It's less likely to have curves or waves in it, right? But when the jet stream slows down and there's less tension in the cord, it's much more likely to have these curves or these waves. So when we have one of these very severe cold spells, it's because the jet stream is taking one of these big southward swings, and that allows the Arctic coal to penetrate much farther south than usual. And it's been demonstrated now in several studies that we are seeing these wavy patterns happen more often when the Arctic is very warm. New research from Columbia University shows these Arctic outbreaks are now happening twice as often. And despite that, human-caused climate change is still making winter the fastest warming season. That's also leading to less snow overall, according to another new study. Cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Washington saw the evidence going more than 700 days without an inch of snow. But when snow does fall, climate change appears to be making these storms even more powerful. Your ocean temperatures are warmer. So when you're bringing that northeast flow off the ocean, that's bringing in warmer temperatures, which a lot of times changes it over to rain. But if you still have that cold air, that ocean, that warm ocean off the coast is going to help to produce much more snowfall. These are the one to two feet of snow that comes in and just kind of cripples everything. The same interaction fuels monster lake effect snow along the Great Lakes and out west along California's Sierra. Examples of how climate change is making winter not just warmer, but weirder. I'm National Climate Reporter Chase Kane. Our thanks to Chase Kane for that.
Coming up, do you ever wish you learned more real life lessons when you were in school? Like, I don't know, how to file your taxes or maybe how to manage your bills? Well, some third graders are being charged rent to help set them up for success. But first, you gotta see this. Dramatic body camera footage shows the moments a heroic dog joined Michigan State Police to rescue its owner who'd fallen through thin ice. Police there attached a rescue disc onto Ruby's collar and sent the pup back to its owner who helped pull him back to safety. That is what we call a very, very, very good dog. We will be right back. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. Rapper Takashi 69 has been arrested in the Dominican Republic on domestic violence charges. He's being held at a jail in the capital city of Santo Domingo, where he was arrested earlier this week. Takashi 69, whose real name is Daniel Hernandez, was also arrested in the Dominican Republic last October. That time, he was accused of assaulting a local music producer. In 2020, he was sentenced to two years in prison after testifying against a known gang. He'd admitted to committing various crimes with. In the UK, measles are spreading like, well, the measles. And officials, uh, officials there have declared it a national incident. Most of the cases appear to be among children under the age of 10. The disease was considered eradicated in the UK in 2017, but it popped up again a year later, largely due to low vaccination rates. North Korea is claiming it has tested a, quote, underwater nuclear drone. State media says it's because North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is not happy with a recent joint military exercise by South Korea, the United States, and Japan. Analysts, on the other hand, say if true, that it appears that the country could be preparing for war. In fact, Kim Jong-un has said he's building up his military capabilities because a war could, quote, break out at any time on the Korean peninsula. And Japan has now gone where only four other nations have gone before the moon. The Japanese government says it used a spacecraft without astronauts to make the landing today. It says the goal was to test new precision navigation technologies. Japan now joins the U.S., the Soviet Union, China, and India in the moon landing club. And the U.S. conducted a new round of strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen today. Defense officials telling NBC News that they were targeting three anti-ship missiles using F-18 jets. It is the sixth time in 10 days that the U.S. has carried out strikes against the Iranian-backed militants. President Biden, however, admitted that the strikes have yet to actually deter attacks on cargo ships in the Red Sea. Remember, that was the whole point of them. And earlier today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Joe Biden spoke on the phone for the first time in about a month. The call comes just one day after Netanyahu publicly opposed the creation of a Palestinian state after the war, something the Biden administration fully supports. All of this comes amid recent data showing that a significant number of Israeli soldiers killed in Gaza have been the result of so-called friendly fire. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has more from Israel. Tonight, the U.S. again taking out anti-ship missiles. The Pentagon says Iranian-backed Houthi militants were prepared to launch in the Red Sea. President Biden has acknowledged the U.S. strikes are not deterring Houthi attacks. The president today also speaking to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu for the first time in a month downplaying Netanyahu's opposition to a Palestinian state. Do you think that Prime Minister Netanyahu will change his mind on an opposition to a two-state solution, sir? Yes, give him the right one. For Israeli troops in Gaza, danger not just from Hamas, but also lethal rates of friendly fire. The latest IDF data shows 17% of all Israeli soldiers killed were mistakenly shot by their own or died in battlefield accidents. That is a high rate of friendly fire, even given that it's occurring in very dense urban terrain. We headed to central Gaza last week to see what the IDF said was a Hamas rocket factory. Israel's standard procedure, destroy facilities like this with a controlled explosion. But this time, disaster. The IDF says a tank shell aimed at Hamas fighters toppled an electricity pole, triggering the explosives early. Six Israeli troops were killed. Among them, 26-year-old Captain Ron Efremi. His family, home, and heartbroken. But his younger brother tells us he does not blame the Israeli tank crew. I will hug the, the men that uh, 
take mistake because I can understand the pressure. What do you say to those... Tonight, we asked Israel's military spokesman, why has there been so much friendly fire? I think uh, friendly fire is a horrible thing, and we, but we are learning uh, every event. Israel says one factor is its troops are under constant ambush from Hamas fighters bursting out of tunnels. Back to you. Raf Sanchez, thank you. Still to come, fire shooting across the sky. A cargo plane's engine catching fire right after it took off. Those details are next, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. Tonight's game between the Golden State Warriors and Dallas Mavericks has been postponed in the wake of Warriors assistant coach Dejan Milojovic's death. It is the second time, it is the second game rather, to be postponed after the Serbian coach suffered a heart attack at a team dinner Tuesday night and died on Wednesday. He was just 46 and was a part of the Warriors 2022 NBA championship. The NBA has not yet announced when the post games will be rescheduled. The family of Kristen Smart, a college student allegedly murdered in 1996, is suing Cal Poly University for negligence, wrongful death, and negligent infliction of emotional distress. Paul Flores was convicted in the killing of Smart last March, nearly 27 years after her disappearance. The family is saying the university did not search the suspect's room until 16 days after Smart's disappearance. For the first time in its history, the Los Angeles Times, journalists there, they held a union or organized work stoppage earlier today. It comes after management disclosed plans to lay off a significant number of staffers. According to the paper, at least 100 journalists or 20% of the newsroom there could be cut. The proposed layoffs follow a leadership shakeup last week and would mark a third round of layoffs since June. Also tonight, a Boeing 747 cargo plane caught on camera streaking across the night sky with flames trailing behind. This is what it sounded like inside the cockpit. It's engine number two, and we're still trying to work out. 200. Uh, 95 of you. Do you guys lose it on the runway or in the air? Uh, on the climb up. Roger. That is the captain of the Atlas Air flight last night, moments after taking off from Miami International Airport. Atlas Air says the plane had to make an emergency landing. A source familiar with the investigation tells NBC News that the preliminary examination of the Atlas Air engine revealed a softball-sized hole above the number two engine. This latest accident adds to Boeing's recent woes following an Alaska Airlines door malfunction and the ongoing 737 MAX 9 ground. Boeing is not commenting on this latest incident, at least not yet. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra joins me now with more. So, Marissa, I mean, this video is surprising, but then also not surprising, I think, to a lot of people, just because it feels like Boeing and planes and bad things are constantly in the news right now. But what are investigators looking at here? Do they have any indication of how long it might take to really have a definitive answer on what went wrong? Hey, Allison. I mean, I can tell you right now whether or not this is Boeing's fault. This is certainly um, not ideal for the company, which we already know has been through a lot in the last couple of weeks ever since the Alaskan Airlines flight. And we'll get to all of that in just a moment. But in terms of this, this just happened last night. This is very fresh. There's very few details. But right now, what we understand is the main part of this investigation is going to be looking at that engine. They're going to be looking at whether or not this was a controlled or contained or uncontained engine failure. Um, and so as of right now, Atlas Air, we know their communications with air traffic control. They reported an engine fire that was, uh, you know, some of the sound that you just used just now, uh, we could hear them talk about the engine fire. You could certainly see it in that video. And then in a statement that Atlas Air put out later, they reported an engine malfunction. Boeing has really only said they're going to support their customer and they're going to support the NTSB in their investigation. You just mentioned how a source close 
to this investigation said that there was a, quote, softball sized hole above engine number two. So a lot of questions remaining here, but we know that it's just beginning. NTSB will be on the ground here, the objective party, to really tell us of who and what was at fault. But I, it is worth noting, Boeing is not in charge of the engine. That is a separate company that is GE who manufactures the engine. But still, uh, certainly, uh, once again, Boeing is in the headlines here, and they're having to put out statements and address this, even if they are not to blame here. Allison. Yeah, really interesting context there. So, Marissa, when we are talking about Boeing specifically and some of the other incidents they've been dealing with of late, what is the latest on the Boeing 737 MAX inspections? Do we know when those could actually return to the sky? Right. So actually, uh, MSNBC's Chris Jansing just had Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg on her show earlier today. She asked him exactly that. And we're not being given an exact timeline. What I can tell you is that the FAA did require certain Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes to be grounded across the United States, 171 of them. And the FAA has said that 40 of those 171 grounded planes have been inspected. And so there's still 100 131 left, Ellison. It's been two weeks and they've gone through 40. So do the math. I think we still have a little bit of time to wait here. All right, Marissa Parra, thank you so much. We appreciate it. It is never too early to start learning about financial literacy, at least according to one elementary school teacher. I mean, almost everyone wants to get better at managing their money, right? NBC digital reporter Maya Eaglin takes us to the classroom where some savvy third graders are learning budgeting basics in a pretty unique way. Hey, Maya. Hey, Ellison. So these classroom lessons are all about having a little bit of fun, reinforcing some basic math, and also giving kids a bit of responsibility. I headed down to Charlotte, North Carolina to check it out. Take a look. If you got 384, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like many teachers, Shelby Lattimore says she loves her job, but feels overwhelmed and underpaid. Thank you. I'm tutoring. I'm a science coordinator. I don't know anyone who is teaching or in education that does not have a second job. But instead of working as a barista on the weekends, Lattimore's viral TikToks have been supplementing her salary as a third grade math teacher in Charlotte, North Carolina. For every million views, she gets around a thousand bucks through TikTok's creator program and brand collabs. This past year, I made six figures. My teacher salary is not even half of that. And she's going viral saying the words nobody likes to hear. I am going to take your money. So you're charging third graders rent. I am. I sure am. How does that work? They have jobs, and of course I pay them not real money. They have to go ahead and pay me rent once a month, just like I have to pay bills. They have to pay bills. So Miss Lattimore is inflating your rent. Every month, $7 of rent is collected for their chair and desk. Whatever's left over, they can spend on rewards or save for another day. Lattimore has over 720,000 followers and more than 22 million likes on TikTok alone. But she says this is much more than just a viral moment. Charlotte is known for generational, you know, poverty. A lot of my students of color, Hispanic, Black, they see their parents, they see their guardian living check to check. They see the money management of not thinking long term necessarily or the consequences of it. There's data behind these systemic knowledge gaps. One study finding that black and Hispanic respondents were at critically low levels of financial literacy compared to their white counterparts. It gives you a life lesson how money is. Marley's in fourth grade now, but she was one of Lattimore's best students last year. Hi, Miss Lattimore. Lattimore says it's students like Marley that remind her of why she teaches. It's very important for, as a black educator, for my students to see someone who looks like them. I'm tired of you looking better than me and our fit checks. What's your favorite thing about Miss Lattimore? That she looks like me. I love Miss Lattimore because she challenges us. I love Miss Lattimore's class because she encourages us. What keeps you waking up every day and excited to go to work? I'm sorry. No, don't <laughs> apologize. Take a beat. Take a beat. Yeah. You got it. Um, 
it's gonna sound so corny, but it's it's them. The corny little hugs that are germ filled, but they like you just can't let go. And it's just like <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> And it's not just viral support that Shelby's fans are giving her. They're also shipping her snacks, school supplies, even hygiene kits to make sure these kids have everything they need for the best third grade experience ever. Allison? Maya Eaglin, thanks for that. We appreciate it. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. The average person spends over two hours every day on social media. Now there are calls for more regulation when it comes to the algorithms we're all being exposed to. We'll explain next, so stay tuned. Welcome back. It is time now for the future of everything. Last year, an estimated 4.9 billion people used social media across the world, with the average person spending, get this, almost two and a half hours a day scrolling through social media apps in particular. That much content consumption is raising concerns about how the algorithms for these platforms are actually being used. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward looks at the growing calls for government regulation. Hey there, look, it is common knowledge that our social media feed is controlled by an algorithm, but who controls that? And how do we keep dangerous and unwanted content away? Well, there are some things we can do, but very few of us understand just exactly how precise and how powerful these algorithms can be. From puppies to new dances to memes, Americans average more than two hours a day scrolling content fed to us through algorithms based on our specific interests and past online activity. But a growing chorus of critics warns that algorithms can lead us to disturbing places and to making bad choices. These algorithms, uh, they are the digital equivalent of AR-15s. Some public figures are demanding regulations. They ought to be banned. They really ought to be banned. It's an abuse of the public forum. It's this like TikTok user show. highlighting some of that criticism. Fascinated. I don't actually care about this kind of content. Well, if you care so little, why were you poking around in the comment section then? So how effective are these algorithms? Think about it this way. A grocery store like this one only knows what you are interested in once you've bought something. But a social media company knows every time you pause, even for a moment, to look at anything. And it constantly reorganizes the store to be more attractive to you. And that's why algorithms earn companies billions each year. But they can also lead us astray. In just three clicks, I can go from date night ideas to mind control seduction. China has censored social media for years, and the EU recently passed laws guaranteeing people the right to opt out of algorithms. Both sides of the aisle here have taken up the question of regulation, but no new laws have emerged. Why is the U.S. so far behind? It just becomes a def definitional issue. So what people will say is, oh, we disagree on the specifics of regulation. We don't want it to be overbroad. But in reality, people are afraid of crossing powerful interest groups, business groups, technology lobbyists. That leaves us to figure it out ourselves. Now, you can limit your exposure by turning off the algorithm in Facebook and Instagram. On YouTube, you can turn off autoplay and sign out, which limits its ability to track you. And TikTok, well, you can reset the algorithm if you don't like what it feeds you. So I think it's important to recognize that, yes, we have some agency, but also these systems are constantly making decisions. Until some national standards emerge, it is you against the algorithm. Now, the thing to understand here is that fundamentally this is a cold, hard business, and that business is based on your attention. Whatever you linger on, even for a moment, and especially when it's something emotionally triggering, right, something in some cases even offensive, the more you're going to get that kind of thing. So while you can't opt out completely of these algorithms, you can control a little bit by just being conscious of how much you're telling it about yourself. Jake Ward, thank you. And finally tonight, let's send you off into the weekend with 60 seconds of joy. Tonight, it is the story of a little boy in Virginia with a birthday, a dream, and a serious love of basketball. Andrew McClung from our NBC affiliate WCYB has this story. To eight-year-old Nicholas Bostic, basketball is a big part of his life. For Christmas, he got a big surprise from Santa to see the Bulls play the Hornets. 
And at his eighth birthday party just a few days before the game, he made a wish. I asked for me to see the martyr version. Nicholas and his family got a special opportunity to see warm-ups, which his mom helped make a sign for that said, please sign my birthday shirt. And after I got it made, he said, will you put something on the other side for me? And I said, well, sure. And he says, I want, hey, DeRozan, I want your job. Then came the day of the game. DeRozan waved Nicholas and his mom down. I wish everybody could have seen it through my eyes because it was, it was emotional to see his dreams come true like that. I told him that he was my favorite player, and he said, thank you. A birthday dream come true. I can't think of anything we could ever possibly do to encourage him that would be more than what DeMar DeRozan done. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.